from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people here for our pre-concert conversation tonight. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm a music specialist at the Library of Congress. And I'm joined by a, a, a great group of people. Um, first is my colleague, uh, Anne McLean, who's a senior concert producer at the library. Um, David Nelson, who is uh, one of the percussionists on tonight's uh, concert. And also, Haya Chernovin, um, who is uh, the featured composer this evening, uh, in that uh, we're premiering uh, a new work of hers uh, that was commissioned by the Dina Costin and Roger Shapiro Fund in New Music at the Library of Congress. Um, so we're very uh, happy to have all of you here. Um, I thought that we would just, uh, because we have a performer with us, we'd maybe start with some of the crumb works and uh, sp speak with our percussionist. Um, when you see the stage tonight, you, those of you who are familiar with uh, the concerts uh, from the Library of Congress uh, may be amazed at how many instruments are actually on the stage. Um, how does this compare to the types of uh, music that you've played before as part of a percussion ensemble with George Crumb? Well, the. The percussion instruments that we have on stage tonight, there are four percussionists, and each one of us has probably at least 30 percussion instruments in our setups. Um, so there's probably well over 150 percussion instruments on stage. Um, the stage is basically overtaken by percussion. Um, and you see us somewhere in there running around and playing them all. Uh, with George's music, he really likes to project a lot of different sounds and a lot of um, sounds that you're not necessarily used to hearing either um, just in general or on specific percussion instruments. And um, he really writes well for that and uh, has us all moving around playing different instruments. There's not too many instruments that are actually doubled uh, between players. Um, and if they are two of the same instruments, we get many different sounds from them. As compared to other pieces or other ensembles that I play with, this is by far the most percussion instruments that I ever get to use. Um, and it's quite an experience. Um, I've been a part of all of George's songbooks. And the first songbook, I would say that maybe I had 12 to 15 instruments in my setup. And George kind of was unsure of, of not of his writing, but unsure of the capabilities of us playing all these instruments. And then when he saw that we were able to do it, then the next one he wrote a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And then, so there's, there's a lot of instruments, and like I said, he keeps adding and, and all these different sounds, and I've been very fortunate to be a part of, of each one of these, and you know, it's such a growing experience, and all of his uh, pieces have, have really grown um, and kind of come to this seventh songbook here. Well, one, one question that um, I know a number of percussionists, and with certain composers, they give uh, a lot of leeway. They'll let them do whatever they want to do. But with other composers, if they ask for the kitchen sink, and then they're required to kind of schlep it all into the hall and then out at the end of the day, they're not as appreciative of it. Um, how do you then, I guess what that comes down to is, um, does the use of the instruments uh, make it all worthwhile? In this case. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, one of the, the great things about George Crumb, um, you know, Orchestra 2001 is based right outside of Philadelphia uh, in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. The next town over is Media, Pennsylvania, where George Crumb resides. So he is very close, and he has written these pieces for Orchestra 2001. So George is always at all of our initial um, rehearsals. He's at all of our recordings. Um, so you always know exactly what sound he wants. 
And a lot of the strange sounds or things that are not very typical of our instruments, George has tried them all. George makes sure that they work on the instrument before he actually writes for it. And if we ever had any kind of difficulty, George will come right up, show you how to do it, show you how to play it, the sound that he wanted. Um, but again, with him being there at the rehearsals, there have been times when he writes something that's just, you've got four mallets in this hand and two mallets in this hand and, and you, you can't get to it. And George, this is a little bit problematic. And he says, okay, and rewrites it. And so with that process, it's been terrific to have him there every step of the way. Um, so he gets to hear his music, he gets to hear, and there have been times when he's heard something and said, that's not quite what I intended, I'm going to change that. So it's it's very rewarding, um, you know, there's nothing that is not meant to be in there. Right. Oh, Anne, go ahead. I have a quick question about, there's, you'll see these are remarkable looking instruments, and there's one uh, that looks like a giant bow, like a Native American bow, but brilliantly decorated with a kind of a gourd affair, and there's another one that has feathers on the bottom, uh, red, br brilliant red feathers. What are a couple of your, fa can you describe what those are, and are they indigenous instruments, or uh, ones that you, anyone can use? Uh, the ones with the feathers, they're Af um actually American Indian uh, rattles um, that I believe are from Colorado. They, they were brought in. Um, George, let me think. There are so many different instruments from so many different countries. Um, and I guess one of my favorite that I play in this is a uh, Middle Eastern instrument. Um, and it gets a, it's called an udu drum. And it has a, it's a ceramic instrument and it has a hole in it and you get a lot of lows and highs and it's just something that I'm not used to playing. Um, but George found, found a use for it in the piece and, and really likes the sound of it. Um, and let me think, there's a Lujan in there, which is a, I believe a, maybe a Philippine instrument from the Philippines, um, just some, some very odd instruments that we're not used to hearing here, um, especially in an orchestral world. So, Just out of curiosity, um, has George broached another project with you that might be coming up? Because I know this is supposedly his final songbook and he's finished with this project. But. So when we played the first songbook, it was just uh, he was going to do this venture, and, and then that was it. And then he wrote a second one. And then he said, well, I'll finish it. So he wrote four songbooks, and that was it. And then he wrote a fifth one, and that's all. And the sixth, you know, and then we, he definitely said after six, that's, you know, he's finished, and, and then he wrote the seventh. So <laughs> we never know. Um, we don't know. George keeps joking that he keeps running out of, of music because all of these are based on um, one of the songbooks was based after um, African-American spirituals. One was based on Appalachian um, melodies. Uh, George keeps saying, well, I'm running out of music to, to write these two. So I guess until George finds some more music that inspires him uh, for the vocal parts, you know, then you know, maybe this would be the last, but we never know. One thing, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, George was not able to make it tonight, but there is a great webcast of him speaking with David Starobin on the Library of Congress website uh, from the last time, I think that was, uh, I'm not sure what year that was. Is that 2010? 2010. Um, with, um, uh, with Thomas Hampson. Um, and they're doing selections from various songbooks. Um, so that's definitely worth checking out just to, to hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were. It's a charming talk when you, when you watch this webcast because uh, David Sterbo knew uh, George for many, many years and has recorded with you guys all the Orchestra 2001 Seven Songbooks, which I, I believe are something like 65 settings, 65 separate texts, over six and a half hours of music. A massive undertaking. Um, and I wanted to say 
too, that the Library of Congress has had a very long and very cordial relationship with Mr. Crum. And of course, probably many of you in the room know that he, his Ancient Voices of Children, which is now considered a landmark of 20th century music, was a Coolidge Commission, Library of Congress Coolidge, Coolidge Foundation Commission in 1970. And I'm very glad to say that uh, recently, he has announced that he will uh, his papers will be a part of our permanent collection. So that's a very important acquisition for the library. Um, the the ancient voices of children, which like tonight's piece, is based on a Yorka text, and uh, of course he was tremendously influenced and fascinated by this poet throughout his life. But this was uh, premiered here in October 1970 for the 14th Festival of Chamber Music, um, for Mrs. Coolidge's birthday, that period when we celebrate her birthday every year. And uh, he called them my children's songs. He, that's how he referred them to, and earlier today, we were whipping through some files that he had sent in, um, and we found a little note that was very sweet. Um, He's writing to the managers of the music division, and he says, would there be any chance of getting a tape dub of the concert? Just a note to say I was delighted with the beautiful performance of my children's songs, and of course also delighted with the audience response, parentheses, wow, exclamation part, point. And he, was, he is, as you know, such a modest, extremely lovely, modest man. Um, when you meet him, he's just like your grandfather, a, a friend. When you're talking to him on the phone, even if you don't know him, he's the warmest man imaginable. But anyway, I just wanted to say that we're very, very proud of that work, and we're proud of being able to present the seventh songbook tonight. One, one thing I'd like to add just about George Crumb's uh, music, if you don't know it, if you, if you, you might, maybe if you know it orally, um, but if you haven't had a chance to see the music, um, go check it out when, you, when possible because it's so beautifully written. And often there are, I, uh, a few years ago I played uh, the two piano piece Zeitgeist, um, which has these beautiful uh, uh, figurations of like the, I think one movement is called the Eye of Morpheus and it's in the shape of an eye. And it's not gimmicky though. There's something about it that's just, it's, th it's exactly what it needs to be. He also has it uh, written out so it's easier to read at the end. It's, so it's, he has like a cheat sheet option there. But maybe one, one feature with these uh, larger ensemble works is that they, um, you're not reading from a part, are you? Or are you reading from the score? Um, yes, we are reading from scores. Um, they are very large pieces of paper and it's almost, that was an excellent point there. We've recorded all these pieces and they sound terrific, in my opinion. Um, but they are very, very visual. And for you to experience the concert and see the concert, see, you know, we talk about the percussionists all having our own little ballet. Um, that we need to know exactly what instrument we're going to next. And that needs to be a smooth move uh, back and forth between those instruments. And our setups are so large that a lot of times, we have the music there, and it's a road map, but we're not, we're so far away from it, we, we can't really actually read it. So we just almost have parts memorized for where to go next. So it's a very visual um, thing, but yes, it's in score form. Um, and for me, for my part, since there are so many different parts on the music, it's a shame I should have brought a piece in. Um, I actually take a red pencil and go through my line and my instruments, when I change instruments, where I go next. So then every time that I am playing an instrument and have to turn around, I can see exactly where that red line is, exactly where I need to be, because there's so much music on the page. I don't think that uh, we could actually play these parts if it was just our part. We need to see how we interact with the vocalists, how we interact with the pianist, how we interact with the other percussionists. Um, and that's very, very helpful for us. Uh, maybe one last question. Um, well, the most important question, really. What is, which instrument gets dipped into the water? So there's a, there's a giant water tub, um, and we have a small tam-tam that gets dipped in there, um, and that changes the pitch when more water is, is on the tam-tam. Um, and then there is a chime 
that goes back and forth, and that actually bends the pitch of the chime. And then there's an Amglocken, and an Amglocken is uh, German for cowbell. Uh, so it's a it's a larger pitched cowbell, and same thing. The the pitch changes. Um, the piece starts out with I believe a tam tam being dipped in the water, um, and again it's it's very visual as well as uh, autumn. Uh, sparkling or still? <laughs> I guess maybe he didn't specify that, but. Um. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, David. I, I, you're welcome to stick around, um, but and you're also, I, I know you have to perform, so if you'd like to. Thank you. Or anything else you'd like to say about Crumb, I should say, before? Um, well, one, one story that I, I like to tell is that George Crumb has had such an influence on new music and new composers. I played a, um, an orchestral piece once um, for full orchestra, and it was with a new music composer. And I had to play crotales on top of timpani and then use the pedal to change the pitch. And it was described in the score by this particular composer, and there was a little diagram. So we had the first rehearsal, and the composer was there, and they came running back, and they said, what did you just do? And I said, well, I said, the way that you have this written is not quite correct. It's the... You know, this, and she said, well, this is something that I stole from George Crumb. <laughs> <laughs> and I just smiled, and I said, well, George is the one who taught me how to do this. And, you know, she said, oh, I'll, I'll change that. And, and so um, she had heard that in, in some of George's uh, compositions and used that and, you know, admitted that. So there, there are a lot of... Um, people, composers, uh, musicians that take his ideas and just grasp onto them. And it's very, I don't know, it's, it makes me very happy to see that, that, uh, that he has such a big influence over so many different people. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Scoot over here. <laughs> we'll both get you from both sides here. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, <laughs> well, we're yeah, David. You want to introduce uh, the work a little bit? And well, I think maybe um, I could ask Kaya to do that, just to, to say a bit about about the piece that we're going to hear tonight. What would you like to hear? What kind of? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe. Um, there's, in your, your programs, you'll see a, a certain type of uh, note, um, but maybe you could just speak before um, going into uh, some of the more finer details, just um, some of the circumstances about its composi composition. I mean, it's, it's titled Lakes. It's part of a series, um, uh, Slow Summer Stay. What, is, uh, what, is, what evoked that, or what, what made you think of that? Um, I don't know quite where to begin because there is a lot to yeah. say actually. Um, but um, maybe we begin from the sound, sounds that you will hear tonight. Um, it's a sound world which is very continuous. There are no melodies, no harmonies, no rhythms. So what is there? There is a stream of sound which actually seems to exert some kind of uh, energy. It is at times moving, at times it's pushing, at times part of it is pushing and part of it is pulling. Um, it is all about effort, action, or stillness. And there are a lot of colors. Now, the colors are not atmospheric colors. The colors are more like traces of movements. Because you know, when, if, you, if you imagine visually this kind of gesture, for example, I could describe it in one line. Mm. Yeah? But if I think about the whole, the whole hand, I need by far more than one line. And if I think about the shoulder, or if I think about my torso and how it holds still when this is going, then I need actually more than 
two lines or three lines, I need also very contrasting or oppositional forces. So in a way, what we will hear are kind of entities, bodies that are moving. And they are very summary for me. They are also very natural, like looking at a lake and watching maybe while the lake is very still, there are small waves at times. Or maybe at times there are bigger waves or a fish that comes out. And it's not exactly, while it's very continuous, it does not evolve in a dramatic manner. Because nature is not dramatic. It can be extremely dramatic to us, but it doesn't operate like a Hollywood movie. So <laughs> it has another kind of uh, innate drama, which is a little bit different. That's as an introduction. <laughs> You know, I was interested so much in the fact that you write pieces that can work together and have a puzzle-like uh, layering or interlocking or interacting, and they're fascinating. Also, I was wondering with regard to this one, if you could talk a little bit about the palindrome. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when Anne actually approached me about writing this piece, I was almost convinced that um, there is no way that I can do it because my schedule was actually very booked. And then I realized that the piece that I was going to write next was something that I thought about as a very fast uh, pencil drawing. And I was thinking to myself, okay, what would happen if I would do two pencil drawings, mm. two fast pencil drawings, that actually come out from the same ideas, from the same kind of uh, visual impetus or even sonic impetus. And then came the idea to write uh, the following structure. To start from sonic events that are, as I described before, that have to do with movement, with stillness, with nature. And to take the same sonic event, events or some of the same sonic events and place them in a different context and make it so that actually they really change their meaning when you move them. Because think about it when we, the way that we listen to sounds. Let's say if we hear a sound of a cricket and we are sitting in a field, that sound of a cricket has a certain taste or meaning or, or spirit to it. But if I'm sitting in my room all alone, and there is the f television going or radio, and my son is doing his uh, guitar songwriting, and suddenly I hear a cricket, that is a very different thing than when you sit in the field and listening to the cricket. Context makes things appear very, very different. So that is what happens between what I call stream, streams, which is a very moving, very energetic piece, and lake, which is actually a very still piece, but they share similar materials. Uh, yeah? I just have a question about that, a bit, and also based on what you uh, said just a moment ago. Um, you, I understand that, that comparatively to streams, it's, there's a greater sense of stillness, but yet I don't sense it, I've only seen the score so far, so, but uh, I don't sense stasis, I don't sense, uh, things are still moving, so what, and if, if it doesn't have what we would traditionally identify as melodies or harmonies or things like that, what are, what precisely, this is maybe a two-part question, what precisely are these events that get translated over or that um, the material that gets shared, or is it, is it more that uh, conceptual thing like the cricket kind of sound, or how, how would you describe those things um, to a, a listener? Um, for example, um, in the piece uh, Streams, which was the first one, the piece finishes with the clarinets, the bassoon, and the violas, and the viola and uh, cello, all around an A, quite a high A. 
and the A becomes a kind of a stream. They are sometimes together, sometimes one of them becomes very strong and the other ones recede, so that the A, even though it's one pitch, becomes like a huge field because a lot of things are happening on this A and it suddenly seems quite fat, this A. And then it disappears. In the piece that we will hear today, this is the beginning. So the end of the disappearance is the evocation of the new piece. And that's what the clarinets is together, and kind of coming together and apart slightly. Yeah. But this is the beginning of the piece. So it's not something that disappears, it's something that comes and is suddenly there. And when it disappears, actually the piece starts. It gives rise to the whole beginning. It's fascinating. And I'm also interested in uh, the, your, your technique of mixing, or, or um, for example, in the Anea crystal set, when you, this is a work where two separate parts come together in an octet, which is fascinating. I know some medieval composers do those kinds of things, and yeah. I know there's a Mio piece. Exactly. You know that piece yes. probably. But yes. I'm not so familiar with many people doing this. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah. So, as I said, those are very quick pencil drawings, which mean that they are quite linear. They are not as complex as much of my other music. And in part, this is because I was expecting or hoping for the possibility of putting them and hearing them simultaneously. So if one of the pieces is all about movement and the other one is more still, even the, though they share materials, what happens when we hear them together? Mm -hmm. For me, that can create a third state which I cannot foresee. Yeah? So I don't just place them simultaneously on top of each other, I, you know, in a random way. But that, that is a third piece which also takes its time to put together where they don't always move together. Sometimes one of them is waiting for the other. Sometimes um, they do something which is suddenly together. Yeah? Some things would move. Um, but what we will get is a third piece, which is actually for two octets, two similar octets. And we have 16 players. And they play, each of the, each group is playing with its own conductor, that, oh, that piece. And actually the structure that we will get from, for slow summer stay theory is a strange palindro palindromic canon. As I said, the beginning of one piece is the end of the other. In the middle, or what is the middle for one of them and what is the three quarter for the other, they meet and they play a part which is unisono, which is like a window to something else. All those things sound very cerebral, but actually for me they are not. Um, there is a cyclical feeling to these pieces, which is going from the atom of every event to the large structure. So it's also something very sensual for me that comes really from the material itself and goes to the big structure. Um, maybe one thing I'd, I would like to ask a bit more about, um, you mentioned that with this, uh, at the end of streams, I think you said, um, there's a high A that has this, um, but it's really, it's multiple instruments playing it at the same time and creating different like levels of space within that same pitch. Um, is this, uh, it seems, again, I'm, and I'm going from the score, but it seems like you have lots of uh, ideas where the instruments play this sort of a supportive role to open up space for each one of these types of events. Um, and that seems to me, just from looking at it, to be uh, a mode of development and exploration. Is that true or is that? Thank you, that was very beautiful. Opening space, uh, that's something that I really listen for. So, you know, when we are in a room, let's say we are in this room now, and we are listening to the talking, we want to understand what is being talked and what are the questions and the answer. But actually there are a lot of other sounds in this room. 
So once we listen, you can hear all the white noises that are going on. There are layers and layers of them. If uh, there is one which is around there. Uh, yeah? <laughs> there is one. So, but these are not even sounds. These are kind of pre-sounds or um, these are like the dust that we don't see when we look on, we look at objects and sometimes the, the sun goes into the room and suddenly we can see the dust. I love looking at the dust. <laughs> and lately I love listening to those layers of white noise that basically create the space. Because I think that even if you close your eyes, you could differentiate, am I in a big room? Am I in a small room? Am I, am I in a cave? Am I outside? And those are different spaces. And what you said was very acute, accurate, yeah. Okay. Do you ever use, just speaking of the space, do you ever use spatial processing or do you manipulate sound in your work? Are you interested in that at all or don't need it? Um, you know, there are, uh, Roger Reynolds is sitting here in the room and he is the specialist uh, in that regard. I have never um, dealt with this in, in such a concentrated manner. Um, I dealt with different kind of specialization, but not this specific one, but I'm doing it actually in, in with, not electronically, but I'm doing it instrumentally. Mm -hmm, exactly. yeah. Oh, and maybe this is a good lead. David, David knows a lot about the theory of orchestration and how, uh, we talked about this a little earlier, and maybe that's a good way to segue into meta-orchestration. Is that the term you used? Uh, <laughs> wasn't expecting to. Um, no, I, I think, um, I, I guess one, one thing that comes out of just what you've been saying, um, and that maybe you could speak a bit more about, not just with respect to this particular piece, but with your other works, um, is that not only are at the kind of micro level are, are things happening uh, where you're um, exploring uh, the sounds and the spaces at the moment, but it seems like um, it almost, you're building into your planning, again, this is just me talking from the outside, but um, that you're building into your planning future spaces to look at where you have series of pieces that involve the same material or sim related material um, so that you're al always already in that um, space of providing more opportunities for yourself. Uh, is that something that is typical of, of your writing or? Again, that is right on the mark. Um, I, I view my, um, my body of work almost like maybe a kind of a, it's, you know, it's a path and each work really enables the next one. But also all of them together create a strange garden. And Actually, it's not a garden where you have that species and the other species, like an arboretum. arboretum yeah. It is more a, a garden that is accumulating forms of life, and as it becomes bigger, its expression becomes actually more concentrated. That's what I would like to hope and more vital, as if all those different pieces are kind of research or search for the piece that will come later, which will be the resonance of everything that has been done. So it's bu basically building a kind of a universe, building a place for myself where I can really um, feel um, that I can yeah, where I can be unleashed <laughs> fry, freely, um, a, a, a kind of a small universe, yeah. 
I'm, I'm stunned by that. You're very poetic as a speaker, and not only as a composer. This Thank is you. wonderful. <laughs> um, a couple of general questions, um, maybe. I'm curious if you would say a little bit about your work at the Lucerne Festival this, this coming summer. Haya will be featured as the composer in residence there, which involves an opera and many other things. Perhaps you talk about that. Yeah, this is uh, probably the biggest honor that has been uh, bestowed on, on my work so far, and I'm very humbled by it and extremely excited and nervous. Um, it's um, a large perspective. Um, Lucerne Festival is um, a very old festival in Europe and probably on the same level of um, quality and um, prestige, like the Salzburg Festival in Austria. Austria. Both of them are leading festivals, not only for new music. And uh, this year, I will have two orchestral premieres. So um, there will be a premiere for the Divan Orchestra, conducted by Daniel Barnboim. Um, this is a piece which is called At the Fringe of Our Gaze. And if you think about this name, At the Fringe of Our Gaze, that's the dust I was talking about. <laughs> so it's a piece that really exposes what is underneath music, what is underneath what we call music, the melodies, the motives, the rhythms, what lies underneath. Just like in speech, when, when we talk and we communicate with words, but what do we communicate with our eyes, with our hands, with our intonation, with our sitting posture, etc. Then there is a, another piece for orchestra and guitar. Um, and then there is a slew of uh, chamber, chamber uh, music pieces, among them Anea, which will be played by Jack Quartet, that you probably know about, and Diotima Quartet. Those are two, two quartets that are also put on top of each other. And then um, my op first opera, Pnima, will be, um, will be done with a new production and performed six times during the festival. So um, really, a lot of pieces and um, those very important two premieres. And um, another question that you and I touched on a little bit this afternoon, you mentioned that your husband is a composer as well, Stephen Takasugi. And I'm not aware of so many husband and wife uh, composer partners. We can think of a few father and son ones, perhaps, and so on. And the only other one I can think of is Chen Yi and Zhou Long. Maybe that's it. But I was curious what you might say would be some of the most stimulating aspects of being married to a composer, and some of the perhaps more tricky aspects. <laughs> Composers are complex people. <laughs> Um, but um, I can just say that, um, that Stephen is um, one of the most, and not only for me, the most interesting composers alive, but uh, also an amazing teacher. So when I was stuck in my piece at the fringe of our gaze, I really wanted uh, to get somebody from the outside to help me with the stuckness. But he would not give me a lesson. <laughs> but we had a fight, <laughs> and he really wanted to make up. So I said to him, okay, you want to make up? Give me a half an hour lesson on my piece. I will make up with you. <laughs> this half an hour put my piece on the right track. And uh, <laughs> these are the complexities and... <laughs> I noticed that you had a piece performed side by side at, in Chicago in, in the portrait yeah. they did, and that was fascinating. Well, uh, perhaps we should open it up to questions now, if, if you have some questions for Haya tonight. If you don't mind, if you do have questions, please wait for the microphone to get to you, um, just so that we can record it and oh, everybody can hear you. it. I was, uh, I just had a vision when you just did this, 
and made the sound at the very beginning. And I had an image of a Kandinsky um, painting that hangs on my wall, and he had a lot of theoretical writings, and there were a lot of interplays between sound and light and colors. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit, um, maybe philosophically, about um, sort of other aspects of inspiration for your pieces? Thank you, beautiful question. Um, well, I don't know if you know about the phenomenon of synesthesia. Yeah, I think that um, where, where I am now in my work is really in search for a synesthetic experience, uh, almost like trying to make the ear not only think, but also smell, taste, touch. So it's a kind of an, an attempt to to live the world through the year. And um, it is not only about color, because when we think about touch, we think about roughness or smoothness, or roughness which is patterned, or roughness which is not patterned, yeah? And, and thousand and one other, other touch that you can actually really translate to an audible experience. And you know, when we think about, I don't know how many of you know the word, I'm sure many of you know the word of Anish Kapoor, the painter, the sculpture painter. Um, I still remember many, many years ago when I was a student seeing one of his pieces, and actually later I discovered he has many series of those. They look like half, half, um, balls, but cut. Uh, it, they are yeah. round shapes, spheres. spheres. Yeah. They are spheres, you know, and um, they are they are painted with a very deep purple color, and they are hanging on the wall. They are huge, and actually, when you look at them enough time, you don't see the end of that purple. It looks endless. I love that. And I think that, for example, to do something like that in music would be really amazing. So th those are sources of inspira inspiration, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a Harvard graduate, so I can't resist uh, asking a question about Harvard, since I know you teach there. And, I, and by the way, welcome to Washington. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I sort of speak of a past era now, but um, I'm aware of some of the music history at Harvard, uh, and that you occupy a chair that was once occupied by composers such as Leon Kirchner, Walter Piston, uh, Bernstein, Carter, John Adams studied there. Uh, your music seems so different from theirs, but I wonder if that history informs your teaching at Harvard in any way, and what, what is it like to teach at Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I didn't know about the huge, I mean, I knew about the aura that Harvard had, but I don't think that, uh, since I was not educated in this country, I was not aware of the huge resonance that it had, and I still now am digesting that. Your colleague Carol Oja, I'm sure, could tell you much about that history. <laughs> no, I, I do know a lot about the hist uh, history. And um, actually, two weeks ago, I um, was lucky to hear a work by uh, Kirchner. And I was totally, um, how do you say, blown, blown over? Away. <laughs> blown away. Blown <laughs> away. I thought that this was so, that I, yeah. I was very humbled by it. Um, but I'm also the first woman who is in the composition department at Harvard. Uh, no, <laughs> this is not why I said it, thank you. Um, I also think that I'm a very different presence. Uh, I'm not a master with her students. I'm not um, taking the position of the one who is building a school. Um, so it is a, a very different um, atmosphere. I'm not fighting with my colleague. 
<laughs> If you know a bit about the composition history at Harvard, um, they always had very strong personalities. extremely important composers who usually didn't end up living in peace with each other. <laughs> <laughs> This point has changed. Best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I was wondering how you felt about the Lucerne festival's restaging of your Munich opera from, I believe, 12 years, 12 or 13 years ago. Do you feel it's part of the, the, uh, the global recession that they did not ask you for a new work? And do you have any ideas for, if, if someone were to ask you for a new opera, would you already have things that you would want to say through a musical dramatic? Uh, are you ready to do a new new work as well as revisit your work from the Munich Festival of 1989 or 1990? Um, the, thank you. The, the Munich, indeed, it was exactly 13 years ago, 2000. And um, I'm amazed that you knew it. Um, <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, this, this was for me a major work. And uh, this is going to be the fourth production. This is very, um, this is not usual for, um, I, 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 would, I would call it opera, even though it is really not a normal opera in the, you know, what you think about opera. It's a kind of, uh, in German they call it music theater, but of course in English music theater is also not what we mean, yeah? But let's call it opera. So this opera has been, um, has had already four productions and each of them was very, this is the fourth production. The, all the three were very different from each other. And this interpretation will also be a, a very unique one, I think. And I'm actually very much looking forward to seeing it. So no, I do not, uh, not at all. There is not even a shed of thinking that, um, I think that the reason why uh, they really wanted to have it present in the festival is because it has been such an important part of my career and of my thinking, a kind of a culmination point. Yeah. In regard to the second half of your question, um, I have two operas uh, which are uh, waiting to come out. And strangely enough, both of them were not lucky so far. And I've had so many other things that I didn't have time to take care of them very well. And I'm sure they will, in the next 10 years, there will be two new operas. Yeah. One of them with a heavy metal group. <laughs> <laughs> I think if there are no more questions, oh, there is okay. one moment. Uh. You work in Harvard, and there's lots of brain uh, research going on in Harvard. I just wonder whether you can uh, prove or by uh, brain MRI studies whether you, uh, uh, you're, you're, where you see a line you have the same um, uh, ir ir uh, irritation in the uh, brain as when you see music or s things like that. I just wonder whether ever such studies had been done and you would be a good example to do that. Um, you know, there is a lot of research being done exactly in that area. And there are uh, also musicologists who are working to, to show that there are things working, for example, in Haydn, uh, the Schopfung, the... Uh, the creation, um, there is a whole map or that shows, you know, that um, the way that the sun comes up is documented in sound coming up. And um, they work um, on uh, experimenting with um, perception of, for example, what happens when you hear high sound, what happens when you hear a low sound, and they found up out 
that there are very accurate maps that everybody um, uh, perceive in quite the same way. Also when looking at a painting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So um, it is a whole new science and the haptics of music are something that is really being studied now and it's very exciting. Thank you. One I think I might add to that though is that there are with uh, synesthetes like Messian and uh, Scriabin, um, they didn't see the same th things. Uh, they, they didn't describe the same colors, the same types of things per thing. So I, I'd be curious where that research goes in terms of the differences between those. You know, I mean, of course interpretations vary, and of course what we can learn from science, to my opinion, is always very limited when you come with it to art. But there is kind of a um, blueprint a basic blueprint that can be a base to a lot of variations later. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, with that, I'd like to thank so much uh, Chaya Chernovin for being here with us. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.